Hey, this is Danny Brown, the host of The Deal. Today we're doing a special COVID state of the market. Again, we've been doing this to get into the trenches really going on in the real estate world. I got two really, really seasoned veterans with us today. I got Kenny Stevens, an apartment investor broker for 20 years. He's seen it all, done it all, does a lot of apartments, a lot of investors. He's going to break down what's going on now between tenants and landlords who's paying, who's not, uh, what he expects coming up in the next few months. And we also have Romy Narafshan from Insignia Mortgage. He's been in the mortgage business for 30 years at B of A, at Citibank, at HSBC, been at Little Banks, he's been at Big Banks. Uh, right now he's specializing in more complicated loans that Big Bank will pass on, deals with a lot of high net worth uh, lenders, uh, borrowers, excuse me, and dealing with complicated self-employed situations. So they're going to give us some great context. But before we jump in uh, to you two handsome fellows, I just wanted to give a quick residential snapshot. Uh, there's been about 80 sales that have taken place that have gone to escrow April 1 through April 22nd. Uh, I didn't do this week. I'm just giving, trailing a week. Uh, so there's about 80 sales. Average price on the west side of LA has been around two million, and the high price that went at escrow is about 17 million. Uh, I bring this up because everyone's asking about pricing and comps, and really, some some properties that have closed have had zero discounts and are the same comps that the, that we were seeing. Uh, pre-corona, and some have seen up to 10%, and the average is usually in that 5 to 7% window. Uh, the blue chip, prime, prime property that everyone wants, we're not seeing any discount, you know, and, and as you go to a B-level property or C-level property, that's usually when you see the discounts. Of course, there's exceptions and motivations, buyer sell motivations that will dictate those things. But that's what's going on now. And really in 30 days, we'll start seeing the new comps because the properties that I'm talking about, the 80 properties in escrow, those are going to be the new post-corona comps for residential. The ones that have happened so far were, were in escrow pre-corona. So another 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, we're going to start to sense on is there really a discount and is there any real trends? So that's the real breakdown from the residential, start, uh, residential side of things. But I want to break into what's happening in the real world and get deep into it. So Kenny Stevens, here you go. You've seen a lot of apartment deals in your day. You're dealing with a lot of properties, all yeah. price points all over LA County. You deal with a lot of savvy investors. So kind of give us a breakdown of the market pre-corona, the first quarter heading in, because I think you had, you, you, we've had conversations in the past. It, it's been a very busy time up to that point. Yeah. And what's happened over the last 45 days or so, and, and then we'll get into more detail. But give me a breakdown really of the apartment market pre-corona 2020 and post-corona now that we're dealing with. Sure, um, well, first of all, thank you, Danny, for having me on, I appreciate it. Um, a lot of stuff happening, uh, just a, a very quick intro. My name is Kenny Stevens, I've been a, an apartment broker for close to 20 years in Los Angeles, core metro Los Angeles um, area. And my specialty is, is buildings anywhere from 10 units to 80 units. So that's, that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, it's been obviously a very, very active uh, few years. A lot, of, uh, a lot of transactions, prices just going up and up and up. Um, a lot of it is due to the interest rates. A lot of it is due to the very, very low vacancy rates that, uh, that, we're, that we're seeing in Los Angeles or we have been seeing in Los Angeles. Um, and then really just... Uh, just investor demand. We've, we've had a lot of capital coming in from New York um, because of the change in um, rent control laws in New York. So people got a little frustrated with their investing in New York, moved capital to Los Angeles, which brought a whole new wave of buyers. So um, really, it's, it's, it's been more or less steadily uh, rising or steadily at a, at a very high level, low cap rates, um, very high GRMs, for the last five, six years. Um, Let me stop you right there because sure. there are people that may not be in our market and they hear low cap rates. You know, if you're in Texas or Florida or uh, somewhere else, very different. Let's talk 
and I know it depends on the street and it depends on what block, but let's talk prime blue chip, West side, Brentwood, Beverly Hills, West LA, Santa Monica. What are sort of the average, uh, you know, average cap rates that we're seeing? Cause I've heard some unbelievably low cap rates and I'm just curious to give people a little education on that. Um, in those kind of areas, I mean, you, you're, you've been looking at three, three percent cap rates, um, three. you know, some below three, some, some in the twos. Um, yeah. it's, it's really, it's hard to make sense of it from a financial standpoint. It's just an ask, you know, if someone's buying a, a 3% cap, they're buying an asset that they just, that the location is such that they want to own it. They know that the, the it's going to appreciate over time. And it's just, you know, it's just a blue chip, like you say. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now the market's been really hot, obviously pre Corona. Now talk us through the reality check time. We hit this Corona. Everyone is frozen. Everyone's hit pause Um, from a investor perspective, a landlord perspective, and then from a tenant's perspective, what is happening now? Have the transactions froze like residential? Are there still a few happening here and there? Um, a few happening here and there. So what, what happened immediately was the deals that were in escrow and, the and, these, and even deals that were all contingencies have been removed, ready to close in a day, ready to close in a week, right. whatever the case may be. A lot of deals got canceled. Got it. Buyers had deposits, you know, buyers had million dollar deposits that they walked away from because they did not want to continue the transaction. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it, it, it got, it got real ugly. Um, and, and it's just, it, it's, it's part of it is a function of that. They were in escrow on deals that were very, very, um, aggressively priced, really low cap rates. And when they hear tenants may not even pay their rent for the next year. Yeah. You can see why they take a loss. Yeah. So what happened was that the, that the, the sellers who were understanding of the situation, and the buyers who were understanding of the situation and, and were willing to work together, uh, generally they agreed on some sort of a discount and move forward with the, with the sale. Even after all contingencies were removed, right. you know, could, could be a, a day away from closing, but the buyer just said, I'm out. And what would you say, again, I know it's case by case because I see that in residential, it's all over the board, but in residential, we're approximately seeing a 5% to 7% uh, discount on those deals in escrow. What were you, what have you been seeing and hearing or, or is it all over the board or is it kind of a narrow band of. No, it's a, it's not all over the board. Um, it, the tricky part is right now, or even, even more so, you know, 30 days ago, um, buyers are, are expecting a 50% discount because the sky is falling. Right. Sellers think that there's nothing different between now and February. So the, the, the gap was, you know, like this massive. Yes. Um, and, uh, it's, it's narrowed the, the actual sellers who were motivated enough to get a deal done really wanted to sell. Um, it ended up being somewhere between five and 10%, I would say. Yeah. So similar to residential. Yeah. All right. So probably the closer big, to five, probably closer yeah. to five percent. Yeah. And when you talk about the pricing on the west side and prime LA, I mean that's not a whole lot of a discount. I mean it's a discount for sure, but yeah. pricing has been so high. Yeah. So similar to residential so far. Obviously, we're very early in the cycle. In ninety days, it could be a very different story. Yeah. Hello. Got three kids over here and managing all that. So let's get into that. Let's get into the rent issue and it may be too early. You know, this all happened shelter in place in LA in mid March. So April rents, I imagined, you know, that was two weeks. April 1st was two weeks after the shelter in place. And now today is May 1st, May rents are up. So talk to me a little bit of what you've seen in terms of tenants, what percentage approximately are, have paid the rents in April and what you expect today, May. And I know it's, crystal ball and reading the future, but going further May, June, July, as people that are dealt with unemployment and no income, you know, logic says somebody's going to stop paying rent. Some may have already, but gets what's happening in the real world with people paying rents and landlords trying to collect rents. Right. So a lot of the data that people are seeing is nationwide data. So when they look at percentage of tenants who aren't paying their rents, apartment tenants, they're looking at nationwide data and they're hearing 15%, 20%, whatever it is. Got it. Um, the reality on the ground in Los Angeles from all of my clients that I speak with 
in April, 90% plus collections. Um, I would okay. say closer to like 94% collections for April, okay. um, which is better than everybody expected. Yeah. Um, everyone is expecting worse for May, June, July, you know, moving forward. Right. But no one really has a handle on it. And today, it's too early today. It's usually somewhere probably around May 5th when rent, when rent is late. Yes. You need right? when, when, the, when the grace period is over on May 5th, then we'll know. And then what happened also in April, if you asked me on April 5th, it would have been about 85%. But some people said, look, I'll pay you half now. I'll pay you half on the 15th, half on the 20th. So by the end of the month, it got up to 90, 92, 94%. Right. So we're still very early in, obviously, May yeah. versus today. So we have this conversation next Friday. You're going to have a different perspective. It may be, hey, I thought it would be below 90, but it's still the same. It may be, oh, my God, it dropped off a cliff. Um, I'm curious if you can compare or remember what happened in 08 and 09 during the, those first six months of that cycle. Was there a drop off on rents then? Well, let me just let me just say one thing first is that if 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 you tell me right now that May, June, July are going to be 85 percent collections, I think, well, I'll take that any day of the week. And I think that the majority of landlords in the city will be very happy with that. Be thrilled. Yeah. 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 So we're we're expecting worse. But if if that's the result, that's a that's a positive result. So here's a, a question, and this is now going to weave into Romy joining the conversation. Because the domino effect, you got tenants paying landlords. Sure, some landlords are institutions and have billions and billions of dollars on their on their balance sheets, but mm-hmm. plenty aren't. Plenty are mom and pops, plenty are small investors. They have loans, even the big boys have loans. So out of your apartment clients, and you have a very broad spectrum of, you know, s- smaller apartment buildings to massive ones. So you have a very broad scope yeah. and perspective. Yeah. Uh, how many of those landlords are really sweating now their mortgage and their, their debt obligations heading into May, June, July because of the domino effect of tenants? Is it uh, impacting everyone? Is it a very small? Is it half and half? Uh, it, can you give us some context on who is, how many landlords are really sweating it? Obviously, everyone's sweating it. It's a tough time, but who's right. potentially like, oh boy, they may have to make some tough decisions about paying mortgages, which then leads into Romy's world of dealing with ro- right. mortgage forbearance, et cetera. But I'd love to hear what your take is on that. Um, the, the short answer is not too many, um, not too many landlords, not too many owners are really sweating it right now. It's very early in the game. Sure. Um, and honestly, over the last few years, and Romy can attest to this bank, banks aren't giving people 75, 80% loans. So they're, you know, landlords who bought in the last five, you know, in the last 10 years are generally not over leveraged. They, Good point. They have different percent loans on their property, maybe sixty percent loans on their property. So, you know, they could the lenders built that cushion in there after two thousand eight, so that they know that if 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 you drop your rents by twenty percent, you can still pay your mortgage. Right. So, the problem is if you drop your rents by fifty percent. Fifty percent. We don't we we don't know we what's going to happen. We don't know the math there. So that's the that's the big unknown, right? We're now at ninety ish plus percent, and you know you got you're hoping, and your landlords are hoping for 80 percent, seventy five percent. If it sure. gets to fifty percent or less, obviously it's a whole different ball game, and there's going to be some serious tough decisions, and that's going to now impact debt. So right. Romy, why don't you jump in here? You've been a lender through many cycles. You deal with a lot of high net worth. Uh, a lot of single family buyers. I, I assume you also have done a lot of investors as well. But let's take from your side of the fence, from what you're seeing in terms of mortgages are for the most part, March, April, now May, are the most borrowers still paying their mortgage? And again, I understand there's national snapshot and then there's LA West side where we're really focused on. But what's your, what's your, um, What's your take on what's happening right now with mortgages and who's paying, who's not? Yeah. 
So um, it's actually interesting. There isn't a lot of data coming out of lenders for people who are missing payments. And I think part of that is that um, the banks are allowing what's called a forbearance for you right. to delay your payment, right? Um, and that's, that's what's causing everyone, if you can either not make your payment or request a forbearance, obviously everyone's going to go out there and request a forbearance because they, they don't want to, they don't want to lose their house. So there isn't a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of uh, missed payments because most people who cannot pay are just requesting a forbearance. And from the lender's perspective, for single family, et cetera, when do, you, when do they allow the forbear? Is it for the most part they're allowing it or are they 50-50? Like, it's, it's, no, no, they're, they're allowing it. And you know, what, what's interesting is that um, if, if you have a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loan, the lender has to allow it. It's law. You know, a, a law was passed, uh, this CARES Act that says if you're a lender and someone requests a forbearance and they need it, you have to provide it, right? Yeah of loans are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA loans in the country. So, um, so they have to allow it. Now, what's going to happen later down the line, how they're going to make the payment, if they have to make it in the lump sum or over a time period, that hasn't been decided yet. And also, the big banks and jumbo loans are, are following suit. They're allowing these forbearances. So, you're not going to see a lot of, not, not at the moment. And so, basically, the forbearance... Uh, for the CARES Act allows a hundred hundred day forbearance, right? So yeah. months, you're good. And you get over three months. Yeah. So that's what banks are, are, are going with three months to to six months. So you're not gonna see a lot of uh, uh, um, foreclosures or anything for, for a little while. We'll see what happens in Yeah, it's too early. It's too early. What kind of, if you can give a snapshot, what kind of percentages of lender of uh, borrowers are asking for forbearance right now? It's a really good question. Um, so, I the data came out that about seven percent of all mortgages, right, nationally, nationally have requested forbearances. Okay, the, that number is increasing uh, daily. Each each bit, uh, each month. Yeah. So. I think we had um, three and a half million uh, people, three and a half million individual that requested forbearances. Yeah, so it's interesting, the, the parallel, there's less than 10% not paying their mortgage or asking for forbearance, and there's less than 10% on the tenant side, you know, not paying their rent. I mean, those, those metrics, I wonder if that will continue to track, and as we get deeper, will those stay consistent to go to 20, 30, 40? It'll be interesting to see that. Are increasing dramatically. Actually, it seems like every week there's more and more. Like the percentages are are, are increasing um, much more than the previous week. So uh, you should you should expect that. And then, in terms of forbearance, forbearance doesn't mean you can't pay now. It just means you can't pay now. You owe me later. So what this seems to be doing is punting the issue into the future and hoping that people's income and employment situation catches up and makes up for lost time. Now, I can see in a high income environment, like we all work in with high net worth and ultra high net worth, where that does make sense. You people making that kind of money, if they've lost their job or had to take a 50% pay cut and then it bounces back to 100%, uh, sure, they'll, they'll be able to make up for that. And I imagine that most people in the middle class working class are not going to be able to catch up because they don't have a, enough cushion and savings uh, once they start working even at full capacity to make up that three month, four month chunk. But that would be interesting. It's a good point that we're so early in this. And if the banks are giving a hundred days, I mean, that's a hundred days before they even start the, the discussion of what do we do next? So people that think, Oh, I'm going to start buying houses in Beverly Hills flats at 50 cents on the dollar. It's so far from our reality now. Uh, it's not. It's not even close. Now, what I've seen from the markets that I'm looking at, it's like the better the quality and the better the location, the less likely that you're going to see a discount or it's going to be a minimal discount. Uh, that's also what we saw in 2008 and 2009, where prime time, blue chip, West Side, Brentwood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica peaked the trough 20% on the highly 
uh, demanded properties. And then you go to B locations, C locations, outskirts, and they would get hammered 30, 40, 50% or more, uh, very, it's very different. So, I mean, that's the thing about real estate. So love to also to get your take on, um, the banks and uh, banks and the, you know, the stimulus and how much money is being printed for them. So is there a risk of these banks having uh, financial issues as part of this domino effect? You got renters to landlords having issues. You got landlords to the banks. Well, how about the banks to their stockholders and to the government and the, you know, the, the QE, et cetera? What, what does that look like or what's the risk there? That's actually a really, really good question. And, and it's, Can you speak up, Romy? Because I'm not, I'm not hearing you that loud. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. And um, so you've got, uh, so with the meltdown in uh, uh, 2008 and onward, um, what happened was we've got we had uh, 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 a law passed called the Dodd Frank, right? Yeah, wonderful right. Dodd Frank, so, which introduced what's called the QM loans, quality mortgage loans, right? Where the banks had to uh, make sure that borrowers met certain guidelines that they're able to pay, right? Banks took on the onus of of, of underwriting properly after so many years of you know. Just giving out loans to anybody. Uh, yes. Anyway, can you hear me okay? Yes, much better. Okay, good. So that actually, I think, saved a lot of banks because they were finally actually looking at tax returns, underwriting to someone's income, the debt to income rate. How about that? Wow. So now... People have to have money to get a loan? Yeah. You need a job? <laughs> what? <laughs> so the QM, I, I think, actually saved the banks for the moment. Right, yeah. Because the ones that were doing QM loans, their balance sheet looks good. These people because they have a cushion. Because you had to put some money down. Exactly. Now, on on the flip side, the past few years, what's become very popular are non QM loans. There was a ton of lenders making non QM loans because um, people were buying them. Property values have been going up and up and up. There's an. They thought it was less risk. Loans, right. So now COVID-19 comes and uh, people are, got scared, right? So what happened? So first, the non-QM lenders pretty much shut down, right? Most of them shut down because nobody was buying those loans anymore, right? Yeah. We still have a few lenders that are non-QM that, you know, that we're doing loans. Actually, that $17 million, that $17 million purchase I'm doing a loan for. <laughs> got it. In the high end. But... Um, so those lenders pretty much shut down. So that avenue of getting loans for people who, who don't have who don't have income, don't have assets, dried up. Okay, yeah. for the most part. There's you know if, again if someone has assets or liquid assets or there's a funky situation, there's a loan for them. But those are for you know high high net worth individuals. Yeah. What the banks did, um, a couple of things happened um, with the banks. Um, First, interest rates were coming down right before COVID-19 anyway, and then um, they, they slashed the discount rate, right? That's, that's, the, that's the rate that banks borrow. Perfect storm. So what happened was everybody and their mother ran to the bank to, to refinance. Refi, refi, boom. Refi, refi. So the banks not only got inundated, but right. they don't have the capacity to handle it because their staff's working remote, right? Right. Well, now the banks are like, I can't handle this. The loan officer can't handle it. My processor's gone. The underwriter, I don't know where. Too much gone. demand. Too much demand. So the yeah. bank shut off the spigot, raised the rates right away, even though they're borrowing at almost nothing. Yeah. They don't like, want we can't take your business. We're too busy. So we don't yeah. want your business. So what happened was they raised their rates, uh, especially for refinances. Um, and then they started cutting back their guidelines also. So we're just talking about the big banks now, not not your first. Yeah. Um, give a, so Citibank just as of a week ago, no longer doing ninety percent loan. These are jumbo loans. I'm not talking yeah. about. They cut down ten uh, percent. Um, so no longer ninety percent loans. They cut their higher uh, loan to values down. So you have to put more money down. Bank of America as of yesterday, they're no longer doing eighty percent loans to two million. Now they're only doing seventy five. Yeah. Because of the past two weeks, I'm telling you. Yes. Case, oh, um, 
Wells Fargo, no longer taking refinance loans from anybody that doesn't have previously 250,000 with them, right? right? Chase, stop doing refinances pretty much in a roundabout way for, for people. And this goes on and on. So like, as you see, little by little, big banks are starting to cut back their guidelines also, raising rates, cutting back. Now the, the cutting the, the, the loan to value is, is because they're nervous. They, they're nervous that if this thing continues, they're gonna see more and more default. That's not what they want. So I think this is gonna be a trend that banks are gonna to continue to, the big banks that are providing, you know, A plus rates for everybody are going to start cutting back their loan to values, being stricter on underwriting. And that's, that, that's what I think the trend is until the economy opens up. Yes, very good point. Now, I've heard nightmare stories over the last couple of weeks about what you're saying. Really, borrowers, contingencies removed, loans approved, and then lenders coming back and going, sorry, the sky's falling. We're changing our term sheet on you. We don't care. You now need to put X down or we can't give you $4 million loan. We can only give you a three. Have you been hearing about that? Both of you guys, has that happened and is that common right now? Yeah, that's very common. And, you know, especially right when the COVID-19 hit and all those non-QM lenders, we had, not us, but lenders across the board had multiple loans where they had docs out. They're about to close. They yeah. just cut it down. So there are multiple, multiple cases. Um, even at big banks, uh, I've, I've heard where, you know, they're coming back with additional conditions whatever they can not to do the loan. Not, I'm not say not to do the loan, but make it difficult to do Yeah. And are they doing, are they doing this with strong blue chip borrowers? Across, it's not just risky, but this is even the strongest borrowers or are the strongest borrowers yeah. still okay? The strong borrowers are still okay. Um, for purchase transactions, you can still get very good rates. Refinances rates are higher. There's still lenders um, that have very good rates for good blue chip borrowers. You may have to put a little more down if, if it's in you know the higher the super higher. jumbo. They're, they're still those guys are very bankable right now. I don't know what's going to happen in a month or two, obviously, but right now business as usual. Purchases are getting done. They have a price. banks want that purchase business. They don't want the refis. They do <laughs> want the purchase business. So they're discounting their rates. They're making them a priority. So if you do have a purchase, you should be able to get it done reasonably on time. Um, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. People, you know, who, have, who make money or doctors like who have income, who have liquid assets, good credit. Um, you shouldn't have a problem with that. What the I have people, seen. The has been oh, different, go ahead, Kenny. Danny. So just like on my end of things, the borrower and the, and the strength of the borrower has a little bit to do with it, but really, you know, the lenders are underwriting based on the based on the value of the asset, really based on the cash flow of the asset and based on the cash on the net operating income of the asset. And the banks have no freaking idea what it's going to be. Right, no one knows. Wow. So, you know, it doesn't matter how good of a of a you know how how strong of a borrower you are and what your net worth is. Wow. They don't know if they're if you're going to be getting ninety five. I mean, they've been underwriting traditionally for the last however long at, at 95% occupancy, 95% collections. Like here's your rent roll. This is what you're supposed to be getting. Figure you're going to get 5% vacancy and, and that's how we're going to underwrite. They don't know right now whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20, 30. Right. So they're, they are definitely, um, I mean, right now I have a, I have a deal that's in escrow right now where the lender committed to the buyer a 70% loan. Mm -hmm. um, based on the purchase price. Um, and they, and this, this buyer actually removed his contingencies during, you know, in, in the middle of March. So, I mean, during, during the whole, whole crisis, it's already started. Yeah. Um, and they committed to him 70% loan. Then they said, then they changed that to 65. And right now, still, he's still waiting on loan docs. And now they're talking about maybe dropping it to 55% loan to value. Wow. And they're also requiring a year's worth of principal and interest payments in addition to be kept in reserve reserves on top so of that in effect that drops your loan to value even more and now you're yeah. putting another you know well wow. few hundred thousand dollars in, in as a down payment so it's really getting to be a net 50 55 percent um 
you know, loan, right? Which is a very different investor metric and equation to analyze if you're looking to buy and you're now stuck, your conditions are removed. Yeah. Uh, is that, assuming, I guess why, assuming you have an additional million or two to put down if you want to. Some people, I mean, he may not even have an option. Yeah, it's not an option. So it's interesting. Uh, on the residential side, Romy, you're, what I'm seeing is consistent with what you're saying, that if you're good income, good assets, great credit, blue chip borrower, the big banks still want your purchase business. If you're not, if you need an exception, if you're self-employed, if you're not showing income, if you have this or that credit, that seems to be getting really, really sketchy. Uh, and even the doctor professional loans, I've heard they're not doing those 10% loans anymore. And I've had some, some young doctors are like, oh, for a year they've been looking and counting on that. And now like, oops, which is also interesting. People that have been waiting on the sidelines for years for this perfect opportunity. Now they're starting to starting to question maybe they shouldn't have procrastinated so much but it'll be really interesting because you're saying Kenny the lenders of course have no idea just like you don't have any idea and so if is it case by case with a deal some lenders are still you know underwriting and projecting 75 80 90 percent and in one lender may I say I'm projecting 50 or what are they doing how are they looking at these deals if you're an escrow right now in an apartment deal what um, happens you pray. <laughs> it's, you pray. I mean, I had a I had a refi close yesterday, a refi, and the already loan docs were already signed, and um, and the lender at the last minute said we're gonna we're gonna require a year a year's worth of uh, principal and interest payments, and you're gonna leave that in reserve. So instead, and it's a cash out refi. So instead of cashing out, you know, whatever. They wanted cash. Now they got to put more cash in. Yeah. Well, you're, they're cashing out less than what they thought because now they have to leave another hundred thousand dollars in escrow, uh, not in escrow, but you know, with, with the bank, with the lender. So it's, it's God. all of my, all of the commercial loan brokers that I speak with and all the lenders say, we're, we're, we'll, we'll know more a month from now, two months from now. Like, it's going to settle down when we start seeing what the actual collections are. But right now, of course, if you're a lender, you're looking at worst case scenario and you need to make sure that, that you, know, you can service that loan. Yeah, we are in such an interesting window right now with you know, being a month and a half into this and now starting to hear news finally of uh, maybe reopening partially in the next 30 to, or 15 days. And what does that look like and protesting and. I mean, of course, we don't know. And 90 days from now, are we going to be opened in business? And so this would be a really interesting um, conversation. I'd love to ping both of you in the next 30 days and kind of keep track. But uh, let's get into some interesting, funny career stories. So what are some of the strangest, strangest issues or funniest stories that uh, start thinking of things that have happened maybe with tenants, uh, requests that tenants have had or landlords or crazy stories there. And, and then on the same on the lending side, what are some of the craziest requests you've had or people that wanted to put no money down or had no assets? I mean, who knows? The Colombian uh, drug lord who's got a hundred million stashed in his house, but he can't show anything. Like, any crazy stories either of you can share? I don't think I'm allowed to talk about any of my stories. <laughs> There, none of them are G-rated or PG. I, how, how, I don't mean your Tijuana college days. I mean like business stories. <laughs> the, one of the craziest story that I've had this year was was a, uh, a portfolio sale that I had in um, right around the Grove. I mean, just phenomenal location. Yeah. And, and I had a, I had a buyer who came in and wrote a non-contingent offer. He, he, he actually turned out that he was familiar with the family that was selling the property. He was familiar with the buildings. He kind of grew up around them. He's like, I don't, I don't, I don't need I want it. that. Yeah. I'm good. Let's write a non-contingent offer. Yeah. And this was a, a 60, 66 unit portfolio. Got so it. we were, we we're supposedly going to close uh, December of uh, 2019. It's a 30 day close by the way. Yeah. Also. So we were going to close December 2019, and then all these issues came up with the property, and there were title issues, and there were there were non-conforming units, and there were covenants that were on title that you know. Anyway, it, it was really really hairy deal, and so we extended escrow until March 14th, 
<laughs> escrow was extended until March 14th okay. while, we, while we handled all these issues and, and the sellers were, were all ready to go. You know, they, they owned it free and clear and, and you know, all the beneficiaries were ready to cash out and of course. go their way. Um, the buyer is saying, I'm, I'm moving forward. I love the deal. I'm moving forward. And as we're getting closer to March, all this is happening. And so March 14th comes around and we're like right in the thick of it. It Oops. doesn't close on March 14th. Like, no problem. It's going gonna, it's gonna to close on the 17th. We're going to fund on the, on the 16th. We're going to close on the 17th. Okay, great. 16th comes around. No funding. 17th comes around. No fun. I'm like, I'm at home right now. By this time, everyone's staying at home. So I have like all that stress plus all this stress and the sellers are, are on top of me like every, every hour, like what's going on. The buyer keeps saying, everything's fine. We're going to close. We're going to close. Closed it in the, it, without any kind of a price reduction, without any kind of a reno, renegotiation. Um, wow, finally closed cool. that escrow, um, you know, somewhere around the 20th of March. No discount. There you go. Mazel tov. That's amazing. It was, How, that was the first deep breath I took in about a month. I can see you get losing some hair from that one, <laughs> but you got a beautiful, beautiful hair. Kenny. I'm just gaining hair. I'm not losing hair. Have you taken a shower in the last month? <laughs> you got to think about that. That's a good question. Definitely haven't combed your hair. <laughs> Getting crazy. Roby, so same question. Any kind of crazy borrower stories that you can think of that you've been around? Or um, I've had a lot. I can't hear you. I've had a lot, and I've had a lot um, <laughs> that's to do with celebrities and their blind trust. But I, one, one of my favorite stories was that when I was working at HSBC, I, I, I met a gentleman, one of the ni nicest gentlemen I've ever met, and uh, we started talking at a, at a coffee shop. And he said, yeah, I have this like $600,000 loan on, you know, like probably three, $4 million house. And uh, um, at that time we had a program where if you have enough, you know, you show, show some assets and you have enough equity in the house, you don't have to provide tax returns. And it was like, I just want to refi it. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to get into like tax returns. I was like, okay, no problem. You know, it's not a big loan, but nice guy. And, you know, there's like a Honda or something. Anyway, I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do. I'm like, can you, send me a bank statement so I can see what kind of assets you have. They sent me a bank statement and in one account he has $25 million. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you don't need a loan. I mean, slam dunk deal, but it was like, all I needed was that. It's just a really interesting story where you just, your perception of someone based on. Yeah. He's uh, got 25 million in his checking account. <laughs> it's amazing. Like, uh, that's just one of my, one of my favorite people and one of the nicest clients turned out to be good. Anyway, that was just the interesting. That's great. Well, any last thoughts or insights either you want to share before you get back to your, uh, your busy day on zoom calls? Um, you know, the only thing I think that the, the way we, we, we connected was, was regarding this, uh, the, the forbearance uh, of, of um, people requesting forbearance. And then yeah. for our conversation, I was telling you that um, I believe if you don't need a forbearance, don't request it because you really can't, I, I think it's going to cause you problems later down the line as far as uh, financing. And I, and I still stand by that. Um, so just a couple notes for, for people who are listening. Good point. Uh, during a forbearance, um, the bank isn't supposed to report any, uh, any negative um, right on your credit, right? That's what they're supposed to do. But as I mentioned to you, I, that doesn't always go as planned and you potentially could get a late payment on your credit, which can be problematic. But on the other end of it, um, it will most likely show on your credit that you didn't make your payment and that going forward will probably be, be an issue. So just for people who are thinking about doing programs that don't need to, um, you know, you may consider making your payment if you can, because it, it may cause you problems getting financing in the future. And yes. if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Good point. Yeah, you were saying that. Don't do it unless you really need it because your, your credit's going to get most likely damaged pretty bad. So it, make sure it's something you really need to do. And obviously, some people really do need to and they have no option. But that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Kenny, any, any uh, 
words of wisdom or last thoughts? Um, I, I'd say the same thing on the renter side. So if there's any, uh, if there, if there are any um, tenants who are watching this podcast or listening to this podcast right now, um, it's the same thing. There is, there is no, there is no free rent right now. There is nothing that says you, you, you don't need to pay your rent. All it's doing is saying you can't be number one. You can't be evicted for the next 90 days. Right. So you're not going to be evicted if you don't pay your rent, but you're still going to owe that rent. So if you can, if you can pay the rent, pay the rent because you're just going to pay it. You're going to pay it 90 days from now. You're going to pay it down the road anyway. And I think that's why we're seeing such a high percentage of tenants who, who are paying their rent because they do realize that this is not, uh, this is not forgiveness of rent. This is just delaying the rent that you're going to need to pay. So I'm, I'm really happy that people are, are, are actually paying their rent. Well, that's good advice. So you, you heard it here first state of the market. I got Romy from Insignia. Thank you for giving us a breakdown on the banks. Kenny Stevens, Kenny Stevens team at Compass, an apartment investor broker. You heard you a very, very insightful, knowledgeable, I appreciate it. I'll probably ping you guys in the next couple of weeks to kind of get an update on rents and loans because I know in the next 30, 60, 90 days, it's going to be a very different world. So the rest of you, thank you for joining me in State of the Market. You can also check out my podcast, The Deal with Danny Brown. You can always check out The Deal Pod for our episodes. And I'm going to keep doing these State of the Market in the trenches, breakdowns of what's happening in real time in the real estate market with COVID-19. Hope you're all safe. Have a good weekend, guys. I really appreciate it. You guys rock. Go make some deals happen, hopefully, and keep some deals together. Thanks, guys.